Good afternoon, colleagues uh, um, on our panel and participants from wherever you might be joining us. Uh, and welcome to Post-Pandemic Education Futures, Rethinking Precarity, Place and Practice, um, a panel session for the RSE Curious 2021 Festival, which has been running across uh, this August and which will hopefully be running again um, as a face-to-face -face series of events as normal um, when we come into next year. My name is Keith Smyth. I'm Professor of Pedagogy and Head of the Learning and Teaching Academy at the University of the Highlands and Islands, and I'll be the chair for the session today. I'm very pleased to say that we're joined by a number of colleagues who will have the opportunity to introduce themselves in a few minutes, um, but comprising uh, Janet Brown, Louise Drum, uh, Alice Koenig and Alex Walker. Um, I think from this point, before we do a little bit of scene setting for today's panel, um, we will uh, invite each of the panel members to introduce themselves. Um, so I'm just going to go with the order that I see colleagues on the screen. Um, so brief introductions, then what we're going to do is give an overview of today's session and hear a kind of short pitch or opening statement from each of the panel members. So Janet, could I invite you to introduce yourself first, please? Yes, um, good morning, everyone. Um, just want to uh, say it's very it's a great pleasure to be on this and, and just to briefly introduce myself. I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I'm currently the convener of the Royal Society's Education Committee. And uh, I'm very, very aware of the importance of education skills, but also concerned that sometimes we don't react quickly enough when we see that change is needed. And that's pretty relevant, I think, at this point in time. Um, I've had many different roles over the course of my career, um, and until 2019, I was the chief executive of the SQA. So not surprisingly, I'm a true believer in lifelong learning, both formal and informal. So as a result, uh, uh, so uh, Keith, I will, am I coming back to you now for your opening remarks? Yeah, we're going to we'll, we'll pass to Alex just to briefly say who she is and we'll hear from uh, brief introductions from the rest of the panel. Then we'll go to an overview and we'll come back to you, Janet, for your opening viewpoint. So Alex, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Yeah, I'm Alex Walker, Professional Development and Recognition Lead at the University of the Highlands and Islands, uh, where I facilitate and lead professional development opportunities, primarily uh, for colleagues uh, working in learning and teaching around enhancement and sharing good practice. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Louise? Hi, my name is Louise Drum, um, and I am um, an associate professor at Edinburgh Napier University. And my area of expertise in terms of my teaching and my research is the use of digital technologies for learning and teaching in universities. So um, one of the things I've been involved with in my university over the past years, I've been leading a project to help um, colleagues, staff members, um, whether they're lecturers or professional services, um, support learning online and support their students online. So getting that balance between the technology, the pedagogy, so the way that we're teaching and, and the sort of the human aspect of what it is to uh, do emergency remote teaching. Great, thank you, Louise. And finally, Alice. Yes, hello. Thanks for, for inviting me on the panel, Keith. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in classics at the University of St Andrews and also a member of the Young Academy of Scotland. And the Young Academy and the RSE, Royal Society of Edinburgh, are currently working together on a project um, that's really looking at the future of tertiary education in Scotland. Um, so, and I sit on the working group for this project, so I've spent quite a lot of time over the last 18 months looking at different aspects of higher and further education and also consulting different stakeholders about their hopes, but also their concerns for the future. Great, thank you, Alice. And thank you everyone who's agreed to participate on the panel today. It's fantastic we've got a panel that can offer um, a, a sectoral view on some of the issues we'll be exploring today, um, as well as perspectives from learning and teaching, staff development, um, and also kind of uh, wider aspects of policy and practice. Um, so without any further delay, um, just to set the scene for today, so our panel is focused on post-pandemic education futures. Um, what are the implications of COVID-19 and the challenges we've had over the last 18, 19 months in terms of how we might rethink um, precarity, place and practice with respect to um, really today we're dealing with formal education, formal learning and teaching um, in the schools, college and, and university kind of sector, if you like. So in terms of um, a little bit of kind of broad scene setting, on this notion of precarity, 
um, I think we might argue that engagement in formal education has always thus been precarious. Um, uh, learners who are going through the formal school system, they're doing so at a time of personal um, and physical development. Um, uh, that in itself brings its challenges. Um, we are aware that um, in many corners of society, um, school is a safe place for many young people. Um, and that has lots of implications for their own development and their own well-being. Um, but even when we think about the college and university sector, um, we might acknowledge the, the precarious nature of some of that for some of our students. Um, so many of our full-time students are actually effectively part-time already when you take into account part-time working responsibilities, caring respons responsibilities and so forth. And for university students um, in a good part of the sector, um, uh, there's the challenges and precarity around their own financial situation um, with, the, with you know, the payment of fees and all that implies in terms of what they will be left with as they leave kind of university. So engagement in formal education has always been precarious and it's perhaps even more so um, given the situation we found ourselves in in recent months. Certainly one of the things that the pandemic um, put a very keen lens on and certainly um, uh, kind of underlined for us um, was the, the, the real kind of disparity between those learners who have and those who have not, both in relation to technology and resources, but also in relation to space. And I think that's really been revealed and, and underlined quite strongly um, as learners in every part of the education sector have been studying from home the best they can with the resources and people and space that's available to them. There's some emerging research um, and also we know from our own experience as educators that this has been having some implications around um, attainment and what's been possible for some learners versus others um, uh, during the kind of pandemic and what the possible implications of that might be um, going forward and, and as um, learners have returned to school and slowly return to college and university campuses. Readiness is also an issue though. And even though we may have um, arguably a more digitally literate um, uh, population of learners and educators overall, um, it's not the case that all the learners and all their educators are you know, kind of comfortable with using technology. And even those that are comfortable with using technology, when the pandemic hit, very few of them had self-selected to study fully online or self-selected to teach fully online. And we've got lots of implications there in terms of readiness both in relation to and through the pandemic and the possible implications going forward for learners and educators to make good use of technology as we slowly move out of this situation. There have been challenges but there have also been many positive things that have happened um, in relation to the pandemic. Um, our, our kind of schools and our campuses have been putting up physical um, ramps for many many years in terms of accessibility. Um, when the pandemic hit we suddenly put up virtual ramps and made education at all levels accessible um, for a range of our, our learners um, in ways that, that it needed to be, but also in ways that it hadn't been before. And certainly we've, we've seen many arguments dispelled around, well, you just can't teach that subject online. We've seen that any subject can be supported at least partially online. So there's some implications there. And then beyond that, um, we may want to consider the reality and also the possibilities going forward um, of the school, the campus, the curriculum as distributed and co-located places that aren't just in one fixed location. Um, that has challenges, but it may also bring opportunities, particularly for learners who, for whatever reason, maybe through disability or caring um, responsibilities uh, or um, their own location maybe can't easily get to physical locations for learning and teaching. So that hopefully sets the scene in terms of some broad experiences or issues or things we might consider. And at this point, we're going to move to each of the panel members to hear their, their own take on what they see as the key issues. So we'll, we'll hear from each panel member for a few minutes, and then we'll break out into um, further questions and discussion for the rest of the session. And if we can turn to our panel members um, to hear from each of them just for a few minutes around their own take on the key issues, challenges, their own perspective on what we've been through over the last few months and possible implications. So Janet, I'm going to turn to you first, if that's okay, please. Yes. 
So as, as Keith's already highlighted, there have been very significant challenges for the last 18 months. But for what, whatever circumstances uh, they face, students and universities and colleges have continued the courses and undertook assessments and, and coursework online. Um, the materials that have been developed have been developed very, very rapidly using both traditional and innovative ways to impart knowledge, but also to assess students and provide the necessary qualifications for them. Similar approaches were taken for children in primary and secondary schools. With teaching and learning being severely disrupted, though, qualifications were based on teachers' estimates rather than external examinations. When the results were announced, all countries in the UK saw a marked increase in attainment. In Scotland, for example, in 2020, there was an almost 15% increase in the overall attainment at higher. And in 2021, the numbers achieving an A grade at higher increased by 20% over that scene in pre-COVID 2019. So that means a much larger number of uh, school leavers achieved the required grades for entry to universities and colleges than they would have done in a pre-COVID year. And it's really important to understand what implications that has in terms of any partic particular challenges they may face in terms of uh, a lack of exposure to certain aspects of the courses, for instance, as a result of the disruption to teaching and learning. We need to understand and address the wider implications for education for everyone, whatever their age, that has happened during the pandemic and make support available for them to ensure their long term success, because there's been a significant amount of worry about whether this generation might be blighted over the longer term as a result of the events of 2020 and 2021, uh, particularly those from less, less advantageous backgrounds. So the last two years were unprecedented. And we hope that we're now moving back to a more predictable future. But should we go back? Or should we take this opportunity to rethink our approach to teaching, to learning and to assessment? Let's learn what worked well during the pandemic and build on it. As Keith pointed out, there has been some excellent work undertaken. We've been taken out of our comfort zone and many people have become very, very creative. So let's try and stay there and not go backwards. Let's take advantage of the experience of the last two years to make sure that education post COVID, whether it's in school, college, university, or the workplace, is truly preparing people for the 21st century. Let's be radical and review what's taught, how it's taught, how different students learn, how we can assess their abilities in different ways, and how what support should be available and how it should be provided as they progress into their future careers. So learning, teaching and assessment can benefit greatly from digital developments. Let's embrace them. COVID has shown that we can use technology to share, to learn and to keep connected, whether we're five or a hundred. It's not a question of either or. It's not an either or decision at all. It's about using a variety of methods and choosing what's best suited to the context. That often misunderstood term blended learning. We shouldn't be just providing information via a stream, for instance. We should use technology in an interactive value-added way to truly excite people and enhance learning. Providing engaging context, personalized and self-paced on-demand learning to address some of those issues that, that Keith has raised. We can also assess knowledge and skills as students learn, moving away from the exam hall and rote learning. We can provide virtual environments to te test technical skills, problem solving abilities, teamwork and communication, all of those attributes that are well recognized as critical to success in the 21st century. But if we want to do this, it's not only a, a question of changing the education sector, it also means change for Scotland as a whole. The question is, can Scotland move beyond what it regularly talks about? That in my day, exams were much harder, that all knowledge need to be learned rather than accessed. For instance, I didn't have access to books and the internet when I was doing my exams, that face-to-face -face teaching is always the best, that the digital divide means you can't use technology in mainstream education, we can get around it, that pass rates are higher are the measure of success of the school education system, that going to university should be the goal for all, do we really believe in parity of esteem? These concerns are not new, but if we address them, then we can truly have a really good, positive post-COVID education system. So let's let the debate, debate begin. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Janet. So much for us to think about there and um, uh, a great opening to um, uh, our deliberations. Um, particularly, you know, some really key strong messages in there around potential disadvantage going forward, but also the opportunities and maybe dispelling some myths at this point in time to radically rethink how we approach learning and teaching going forward. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Um, we'll move now to hear from Louise. So over to you, please, Louise. Um, thank you, Keith and, and Janet. That was really interesting. Um, I have a few brief points I'd like to start with. And I suppose one of them is just looking back, a brief reflection back on what happened, what just happened over the past couple of years. And, and I think we can't underestimate the extraordinary effort um, on behalf of um, parents, uh, pupils, students, uh, teachers, academics, administrators uh, across the whole sector in terms of what happened. And it was a, a rapid change into emergency remote um, learning and teaching for everybody. And, and education in general moves very slowly, but um, there were things that happened so rapidly that we would never have imagined could have happened. And just taking the example of assessment and uh, the, the, you know, the very long lived um, experience of exams, for example, in an example being the gold standard for um, assessing authentically um, individual students in that environment and how rapidly that changed. I mean, just just looking back at that is quite extraordinary. Um, I suppose one of the, the, the points that I would like to raise is around the persistence of ideas around what is online learning and teaching and the danger of the idea that what happened then was actually the same as intentionally designed online learning and teaching as designed by people who are experienced um, with that and experienced with the technology, but also what it is to do that in, from a pedagogical point of view, from so from a, the learning and teaching point of view. And I think we just have to dispel those myths a little bit around, um, and this is very much around the dialogue and the debate about um, you know, fees and students, um, um, particularly south of the border, and value for money and what it, exactly it is that that they're expecting. As as Keith said, I think in your opening, we don't, you know, nobody actually signed up for this. And there's a very different um, approach when we think about learners who are coming into a situation knowing that it's going to be um, online or or potentially blended, um, as opposed to what just happened. So I would like to make sure that we 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 kind of make sure that we're the debate is differentiated. Uh, between those two different scenarios. Um, looking forward, I think there are some potential um, pitfalls and hiccups around um, moving back into more face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, whether that's blended or, 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 or kind of partially on campus or partially in classrooms um, and partially online. And I think it's, it's a third way. And for the academics that I'm supporting and, and looking at at the moment, they've moved from one on, uh, on campus um, traditional model very rapidly to a wholly online model and now we're looking at um, now now a sort of a hybrid approach with students attending partially on campus partially online and that's a different model because you have that face-to-face -face time and it's a different way of thinking about learning and teaching so I think this has to be a softly softly approach to that not least because we have um, there is a little bit of a debate around the idea of full flexibility for students. So students having full options about going online or being on campus and actually to design for that as a teacher, as an educator is really difficult. And it's really difficult to give parity of experience and learning experience and engagement with students in all of the things all of the time. So I think choice is something that will have to be kind of fleshed out a little bit. Um, I think uh, the last thing I want to like, end on is really about how could we in future years look back on our school leavers, our college leavers and our graduates and um, and how can there be anything uh, positive or in terms of what it is to be a COVID graduate or a COVID school leaver? Are there skills? Are there things that, um, you know, within CVs or, or uh, you know, employment interviews that somebody can say, well, actually, I studied at, you know, uh, at third level in my first and second years uh, during COVID and that brought um, a kind of uh, an independence of learning or a digital skill set 
or an understanding of my learning that it, that might be uh, might not have been quite so surfaced in other situations. And this is where I think uh, we talk about digital literacy, but I think there's an opportunity here for educational literacy not just in our student bodies, but in, in our society a little bit more generally, by thinking about fleshing up what it is learning is, what it is, where it is that it happens, and how do different educators and different subjects uh, enable that to take place? And just upping our language game a little bit around how we discuss these things. Thank you, Keith. Thank you very much, Louise. Again, so much for us to think about there. Um, just to pull out a couple of things, which I'm sure we'll return to, um, but certainly the, the idea of um, uh, the exam is a gold standard. And actually we've seen that there's um, uh, a richer ways to, you know, a richer range of ways to kind of gauge and assess learning. But also um, your point around um, uh, the third way, um, many, many educators in various parts of the sector will know that campus-based versus online or face-to-face -face versus blended were never a, di a dichotomy. Um, but they were very much presented as such at various points throughout this pandemic from uh, we'll keep our kids in school, that's the best place for them to be, um, to we've got to do homes, homeschooling and, and home studying, blended's best, to back to let's get everyone back on campus in school because that's the best way to learn. So mixed messages, I think, um, for the public and, and, and um, uh, for the sector as well, um, in terms of the narrative that's unfolded throughout the, the kind of last um, year and a half. So I'm sure we'll come back to some of that. So thank you very much. I think this whole, whole thing about um, the third way and also not, not mixing up or confusing contingency or emergency moves to online learning with what effective technology enhanced learning can really look like. So some really key messages there. Um, Alice, if we can turn to you, please. Yes, thank you. Um, as you say, Keith, some really fascinating points coming out there. Um, so um, my expertise is very much in higher and further education, uh, um, and I'll, I'll focus on that in my short comments now. Um, as others have said, I think it's really hard to underestimate the scale of the experiment we've just been through. Um, and there has been lots of creativity, as Janet said, but it has also thrown up lots of really interesting questions for us to wrestle with. Um, it's safe to say that in the higher education and, and further education sector, there were already there was already a kind of sense of crisis almost change needing to happen, uh, um, uh, lots and lots of questions already, uh, um, lots of threats effectively have been building to the UK's higher education system for quite some time and that's precisely why the RSE and, and Young Academy of Scotland are running a project looking at tertiary education futures. And I just want to highlight really a couple of things that have come out of our debates actually about the future of tertiary education in Scotland. Um, one of them is the sort of the lack of understanding of the social value of higher and further education and its importance to society beyond graduate employment outcomes. So in the press, often um, colleges and universities are pilloried by politicians um, for not offering value for money. I think that phrase has already been used um, either to students or to taxpayers. And those criticisms usually revolve around the sort of the perceived role of the college or the university to improve graduate employment outcomes, um, to meet the UK's skills needs, to boost economic productivity and so on. Now, not all press coverage is negative, of course, um, but there is a lot of focus on the cost and the economic balance sheet effectively. And there's not enough focus on the wide package of social and educational goods which, which further education and higher education offer. So one thing I would say is that going forward as part of this sort of big discussion about the future of education, um, we need to think about the frameworks um, that we have for measuring what further and higher education contribute to society. And we need some better informed public discussion of it. Um, so, you know, that goes beyond this idea of producing sort of job ready workers who can boost the economy um, and so on. In one of our recent Young Academy and RSC debates, um, we had um, Carl Gombrich, who's Director of Teaching and Learning at the London Interdisciplinary School. And he used a very interesting phrase that, that is, is out there already um, when he talked about citizen scholars. Um, and universities and, and colleges help turn citizens into scholars and scholars into citizens. And it's this sort of combination of the two. The, and, and this idea that learning is about actually doing work of value to others in all sorts of spheres and, and of all sorts of value. So I think the first point I want to make is just that we, we do potentially underestimate or misunderstand or at least talk in quite unhelpful ways about the purpose and the value of tertiary education. 
and we need to address this and we need to strengthen the relationship that we understand between education and society. Um, the other main point that I want to make, um, again focused on the um, tertiary education sector, is about marketization. Again, this was a challenge that was facing tertiary education long before the pandemic, but, but the pandemic has thrown some new light on it. So we've got universities and colleges vying for students in an increasingly competitive marketplace. That means that resources can get diverted into sort of branding, campus one-upmanship, a focus on league table positions. Um, and what, what, what really results is lots of competition between institutions, which occasionally drives positive change, but it can also encourage institutional protectionism, it can stifle collaboration, it can limit resource and expertise sharing. And these are the kinds of things that actually we need to be doing if we're to address these macro questions about education futures that, that Louise and Janet have already touched on. Um, so I think one thing I just want to stress here is that as we go forward and as we think about the experiment we've been through um, about all sorts of different learning and teaching um, opportunities going forward, um, that we really need to collaborate um, and that we really need to resist this, this co competition that comes from marketization. Um, so those are the, the main points that I want to make just um, uh, by way of introduction. Um, I'm sure I think we're going to come back to talking about assessment and I would absolutely echo what both Janet and Louise have said about um, uh, you know, the, my experience of um, uh, online alternative assessments has been that, that, you know, that exams are absolutely one of the things we should really focus on doing away with, frankly. Um, uh, and, and just a very quick point on this sort of in-person digital um, dichotomy that, that Keith, you mentioned. Um, obviously, we've seen lots of opportunities for um, digital going forward, but one thing that I think that, uh, um, that we have learned, and I speak as a parent of school children as much as an, a, a lecturer at a higher education institution, is the value of in-person. Um, the incidental learning that happens maybe on the way to a lecture hall or on the way to the classroom, the conversations, the, the sort of spontaneous um, uh, discussions and knowledge sharing, the way in which school pupils can um, look over at what someone else is doing on another desk and think, oh, they're not taking as long as over this as me, or they're not writing as much as me, you know, and, and just that those sort of infinitesimal adjustments that you can only do when you're sharing a space, but that children in particular at a young age really benefit from. And then those conversations that university students have talked to me about really missing on the way to and from lectures that kind of round out the lecture experience itself. So, um, yes, we might have distributed campuses, we might ha have lots and lots of innovative digital learning going forward, but I think I've really learned the value of that in-person experience all the way through the education system. Thank you very much, Alice. And again, we'll return to many of these things um, and just pull out a kind of couple of key points um, from your introduction there. Um, and again, with so much in it, but I think um, uh, it feels to me like um, the, the questions you're raising around the purpose um, of furthering our higher education, tertiary education in particular, to the society we sit within, I think that's come under sharper focus due to the pandemic. Um, I think uh, the, the, the work that universities do in relation to the wider communities, um, I think there's a strong argument that that should be seen as a joint project um, and not something we should be in competition around. Um, but also you mentioned things around citizenship and scholarship. I'm kind of conscious as well that the use of the digital um, opens up really good opportunities for us to share knowledge from within the work of the university more widely. And that might even extend to the work that our students do. So the notion of students becoming digital public scholars through the sharing of the work. Um, and, and the dimensions around that that relate to public knowledge, knowledge that can benefit the public, should be open, should be free, um, and should be there to benefit anyone that can take advantage of it. So hopefully we'll come back to some of those things and just acknowledge um, uh, the participants that have kindly started putting some questions to the panel. So we will begin to pick up on those very shortly. But before we do that, um, we will hear from Alex. So over to you, please, Alex. Thanks, Keith. So um, I wanted to just quickly touch on uh, professional development pre-COVID. So pre-COVID, uh, colleagues working in education who facilitated professional development for educators would typically offer professional development like mentoring workshops and conferences, 
either face-to-face -face or for some institutions uh, like mine through a mix of face-to-face -face attendance and through synchronous technologies that like we're using today. So when uh, the first COVID lockdown forced the education sector to move online, it meant that educators like students, and as Keith said in his opening, uh, didn't self-select uh, to move their practice fully online. And although generally I think, uh, and we've agreed that there's a good level of digital literacy amongst educators, many colleagues uh, were not prepared or didn't have the experience of learning and teaching online to move their practice quickly online. And I think uh, Louise mentioned, you know, the, the speed and the, how rapid it all happened. Um, and I think it was that speed uh, in which it happened in the initial lockdown that was the hardest aspect for many colleagues. So the role then uh, for myself and others in, in similar roles in professional development was to consider how to uh, support colleagues through technology that is used in learning and teaching to support the move to online through professional development, but also to consider um, how best to support educators uh, ongoing engagement with technology to support learning and teaching post-COVID. So for myself and colleagues, uh, this included harnessing communities of practice within uh, my institution and initiating uh, professional development that utilised the existing expertise that we already had at the university. Uh, and that included calling on colleagues uh, with ex experience in fully online learning and teaching approaches to mentor those who are now having to move uh, really quickly online. Um, in relation to engagement in professional development and the shift to home working and, and homeschooling that Keith uh, and others have spoken about, research, research studies in higher education uh, have reported that the shift to online professional development opened up the opportunity and increased the participation for engagement in professional development for particular groups of people, including those with caring responsibilities, who could now balance uh, attending professional development from their own home. Uh, for example, Advance HE uh, did a report that showed the number of women engaged in professional development in HE had increased during the first lockdown. But in relation to what Keith said in the open as well, uh, the physical space was highlighted as a challenge to attend professional development from home in that advance HE report. So uh, as well as that, the opportunity also arose uh, in that first lockdown and since for more sharing of good practice across the education sector uh, and beyond. And we began to see more professional development opportunities being offered across institutions rather than just within the institution that was running the professional development. And in most instances, that was at no cost to attend. And this gave a fresh perspective uh, for what was happening and what is happening in learning and teaching across the sector. Uh, I think we're gonna go on to discuss this today, but then consideration for professional development beyond COVID should consider how we use and embed technology in our professional development provision and formal education programs that is creative and showcases and um, uh, exemplifies best practice in learning and teaching. Finally, though, I do think that we need to be slightly wary or aware, though, that there could be a move towards slotting in professional development between meetings and also an increased expectation uh, for colleagues to squeeze professional development around existing workloads, rather than being, being given that time for travel that would offer the opportunity for reflection prior and post engagement in a workshop or seminar that is probably crucial to initiating change in practice. Thanks, Keith. Great, thank you, Alex. And I think a really important message there um, uh, that we we shouldn't forget the challenges that our, our kind of educators, whether the school teachers, the lecturers, face in having to move fully online, um, particularly if they were not very experienced in those modes of kind of delivery before. Um, but also, I think a really important message in that that teaching doesn't happen in isolation. Uh, educators in schools and colleges and universities, their teaching is formed by the good practice of the colleagues and the sharing of that practice. Um, and by working collaboratively to find ways to respond to challenges and emerging needs, 
um, in terms of shaping evidence-based teaching practice going forward. Um, and these things aren't always obvious to, to those of us that sit outside schools and colleges and universities that there's, there's a whole kind of culture of education for educators to enable them to do what they need to do. Um, and that came into sharp focus when we were looking at supporting staff to move fully online in terms of the teaching practice. So lots of us, lots for us to think about there as well. So um, we're now into the second half of our session where we will open up into uh, further discussion. Um, we've got a number of questions that have come in through um, the Q&A feature. So thank you very much indeed to all the participants that have put forward some questions. Uh, we're gonna try and take as many of these as possible um, uh, in as much detail as we can. Uh, we also have some questions um, that we um, would like to put to the panel ourselves. Um, and we've got a number of observations as well. I'll try and acknowledge the observations that have come in, the points of agreement that uh, participants have shared so far. Um, I think though, what we'll do to start with, a nice starting place might be Nala's question. So thank you, Nala. Um, what are the influences and impacts of technology on students during online learning? Um, and how might the period we've just been through influence the social skills of our students? Um, so I think I'm going to turn in the first instance to Louise to tackle that one. And then we'll see if any of the other panel members would like to come in. So just to remind uh, the panel and also those listening what that question was from Nala. Um, what are the influences and impacts of technology on students during online learning? And how has the period of influence, uh, the period we've just been through, influenced the social skills of our students? So thank you for that, Nala, and over to you, Louise. Thanks, Nala. Um, I think it, it, the, the first part of your question there, it really depends on, on how the technology is being used by the educators. Um, and certainly at university level, this can vary widely. And, and I suppose um, there's there's something around, uh, I want to highlight around the idea of using technology as a broadcast medium, um, which kind of is trying to replicate something that might be happening, for example, in a classroom or, or a lecture theatre, or the, the uh, in, in many cases, uh, a lot of the universities um, that I've worked at have, have quite advanced kind of um, engagement tools that can offer students opportunities to to be the other side of that broadcast. So um, whether it's uh, communicating via text or it is actually something a little bit more embedded into the curriculum, such as making digital artifacts and sharing them. This goes back to that lovely point um, Alice was making about um, citizenship and, and, and citizenship in terms of scholarship and bringing, and Keith mentioned, bringing students out into the authentic real world where um, actually, um, rather than just doing an assessment, that might be something that you do uh, just for the purposes in the eyes of your lecturer only, that it's, it's it's an artifact that lives in the real world and it's something that has a life beyond uh, something that's just fun done for a grade. And I think th those kind of methods and also the, the communication methods, and this gets to the, your second point as well, is also quite helpful because obviously we live in an age of social media and for various reasons uh, to do with privacy and GDPR, um, universities often have like a, a, a strict wall between you know their own um, um, digital tools for communication with and between students and and the external world um, but in terms of social skills I think there is um, potentially um, issues around anxiety of not actually having met other students and what that's going to be like when you start to meet people face to face um, and that equally can be for the educators as much as the students so I think there's probably a certain amount of picking up of social skills and I know Schools in Scotland have been doing that, you know, in between lockdowns to try and help their pupils um, get in, socially embed themselves with each other in the classroom again. But I think at a third level, we're, we're looking at potentially quite, quite difficult to, um, difficult things for students to be able to, because as lecturers, we don't normally do that. We don't normally think about the social aspect of learning because we're in more formal uh, classroom situations. But as was as said earlier, those kind of cor corridor conversations, hugely important. And while digital media may have, um, you know, enabled a certain amount of uh, uh, conversations across things like um, virtual learning environments or maybe informally through WhatsApp, that that face to face um, social skills and friendships is something that really needs to be picked up. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, and, and that starts to unpack a few kind of issues around student support, which we're going to come on to as well, based on some of the questions that have been contributed. Um, would anyone else from the panel like to respond to that question? Alice, please. 
It's just a very brief point. And again, I'm speaking partly as a parent here, not um, just as an educator. Um, I think your question, Nala, was a very important one about social skills. My observational impression is that social skills can be relatively quickly caught up on, but there has definitely been an impact on them. And what that results in is social stress. And I think that's something that we really need to take seriously. It depends very much on the age and indeed the personality of the students involved. But, you know, at ages of sort of around 13, 14, when social dynamics are complicated anyway, taking three months here and there out of the sort of the social physical world, throws up all sorts of challenges which have really huge knock-on well-being impacts actually for, for school pu pupils um, and, and similarly and, and then that feeds back into their learning as well and that, that is definitely something that we've observed a little bit at the university level as well with, with older um, students sort of 18 to 22-ish, 17 to 22. So I think we need to be looking at social stress um, uh, as part of that, um, uh, as that inquiry into social skills and the, the very holistic, wide ranging impact of the, the digital learning and the digital experience. Great, thank you, Alice. And Alice, I wonder we might um, we might stick with you actually just to, to explore something else we we kind of um, uh, talked about in advance, um, and it's around it's around this whole notion of um, a quality of opportunity. So if we think about what we've learned through COVID going forward, how do we ensure greater quality of opportunity for learners to engage in formal education? Um, and that includes responding to the needs of learners in school, further or higher education. Uh, and we may want to consider there are students that may have particular needs. So Thomas has posted a comment and question around students with uh, special education um, and disability needs. So I wonder if you know, that a quality of opportunity, have you any thoughts to share around that, Alice? Um, well, it's obviously it's a huge topic. So if I may, I will just focus on um, the question that Thomas has raised about um, students with um, different educational needs. Um, uh, um, and again, my expertise is very much at the higher education end of the spectrum. Um, and I think it's quite a mixed picture. So I think that there are ways in which um, digital learning absolutely can uh, um, cater for a wider range of needs in some ways. Um, and, and we've certainly noticed different kinds of engagement from students who might actually find it much harder to come forward in class verbally um, and talk, um, who are um, contributing in different ways um, through digital um, media. And, and, and that's great. But what, what, what we've also found, and this is something that has actually come out in some of the Young Academy and RSE um, roundtables that we've been running, um, and, and students and lecturers have been talking about this, is that it's much harder for um, support staff and teaching staff to assess um, um, and to support different educational needs virtually. Um, so the, the in-person in teaching is, it, it's much easier to put some things in place or at least to observe how things are going and, um, uh, and identify needs um, when you're regularly meeting with people and, um, and, and, and seeing people. So I think, as I say, I think it's a mixed picture. Um, uh, but it, what I would say is that I think we need more research and more discussion of that, of how, and, and Louise might be the person to come in here, of how um, this sort of transition to a sort of a more digital format or blended formats and so on, um, how they impact particularly on um, people with different educational needs. Thank you, Alice. I'll invite Louise back in and then I think we'll move on to some of the other issues that are coming up. So Louise, would you like to respond to that? Sure, briefly. Um, within, our uh, within our institution, we've had uh, feedback from students in particular with disabilities who have found um, this, this past year has been um, very positive for them in terms of the, the, the um, access problems that they would normally have, not, not necessarily within the campus, but actually getting to the campus um, can be a, a, a huge problem. So actually having that move to um, everything being universally online was was of great benefit to to a, a certain number with particular um, disabilities. Um, in relation to to the question around um, 
autistic students and and other um and other areas there's these students um and this again this is anecdotal i suppose when we're talking about that social stress around um talking about um you know live interaction and that, that those kind of things when something is distributed when it's asynchronous so when people are interacting in a in a distributed way where they have time to think about what they type into the chat or things like that it, it has meant it's got uh, been a little bit more accessible uh, for some of those students Great, thank you very much, Louise. And I think you know um, uh, issues around the quality of opportunity and uh, the greater the greater scope for a, a quality going forward um, may be something we kind of come back to. But I certainly, think it's been acknowledged in the sector. There's there's an opportunity here to to build upon what we've had to do um, over the last 18, 19 months to make things more accessible, more inclusive, and to widen participation. I'd like at this point though to move on to. A topic that was mentioned a number of times in the opening provocations around assessment um, and Derek, thank you Derek, has posted an observation around um, assessment, um, pointing out that through the pandemic we've focused quite a lot on how we teach rather than the what of teaching and he's linked this into um, uh, I guess the, the difference between the skills and wider purpose of, of kind of learning and teaching to attainment and assessment. So Janet I'd like to turn to you at this point um and just put to you the kind of question you know given what we've learned through the pandemic given what it was a necessity to adjust to the traditional forms of assessment including exams in particular do they still have a place in our system post-covid and should things like exams be as dominant as they once were pre-covid um well thank you thank you uh, derek for for the comments because I, I i totally and utterly agree with you we we have not focused on what we teach we focused on how, and I think one of the things we need to be thinking about in COVID is, is sort of focused it, focused our minds on it, is what do people need to know and what do people need to know how to access and to be able to capture, to be able to do what they need to do in the future. So I think that's a really important point. And, and that did, as you rightly point out, lead to the fact that um, in, the, in the senior phase, what you needed to know was driven by what was coming up in the qualifications. Uh, I'd like to sort of just remind everyone, though, that at, at some point in the qualification structure, there were other ways of assessing being applied, not just examinations. The two words are not the same, and they should never be confused in my mind, but I am pretty pedantic on that point. Um, I, think, I think assessment is important because it's important for the student to know where they are, to know uh, how, how they're progressing. It's important for the, the place that those students are going to know how well those students have done in their previous work and if that work is relevant to, to what they're, they're about to start embarking on. So the way that assessment is done should be based on what you're trying to assess and what you're trying to assess should be based on what people know, what need to know to be successful. So I think in terms of the specific question, should exams be brought back and should exams be in place? There are some things that exams work really, really well for. Um, one could argue that in order to be able to do mathematical problems later on in life, you have to have a really good solid base in mathematical principles. And, the, and a good way of assessing that is through problem solving. And that is tends to lend itself to the ability to do that through an examination. But I personally would not like a written exam to be used for a doctor who's going to operate on me and remove my spleen. I would far rather that's done in a practical assessment that actually allows them to demonstrate their skills and their abilities. So for me, we should be looking at how, what do we need to be learning? How do we then uh, decide what we need to assess? And then how do we assess that? And it, we should use whatever method is, there is that is possible. Scotland's a great place for digital games. There are places for digital games to be able to assess people's abilities because uh, if you're trying to work out whether someone could effectively put out a fire on an oil rig, that's hard to do on a piece of paper in an exam, but uh, if they're faced with an interactive digital game, theoretical game, hopefully, then you can, you can basically understand how they're going to react in very pressurised situations and how they're going to be able to deal with things. So we need to think of assessment in a much, much broader way than just examinations, and going back to the old system is not the right way. Thank you, Janet. And um, <clears throat> it strikes me as well that in relation to the way in which our learners have had to respond uh, during the pandemic, they've developed 
lots of kind of or enriched their existing digital skills and literacies. Um, they've had to be resilient and, and, and develop forms of kind of individual and, and also collective resilience. And it just strikes me that um, going forward, our assessment practices maybe aren't currently alert to those wider skills and attributes that our learners have developed before and are currently developing now. And, and maybe that's something we need to think about as we kind of move forward. That's, that's the skills to the 21st century. We need to decide what people need and then we need to find out how to help them attain them and then how to assess that they've got them. Thank you, Janet. And hopefully that answers some of the questions and comments that, that colleagues have been sharing online as well. Alice, I'll bring you in briefly. And then um, I'm conscious of just how quickly this hour is flying by. I'll bring you in briefly, Alice, and then I'd like to explore, at least for a few minutes, some of the, the staff dimensions to this. So, Alice, over to you. So just very briefly, one of the words that's been turning up in our Young Academy and RSE debates has been around competencies, which consists of skills, knowledge and behaviours. And I think that that trilogy of things is a really interesting thing when we're thinking about how we assess. And the only other point I'd like to make is that, um, Janet, I agree, some things are best and languages, for example, are best assessed by exams because that actually drives learning. OK, and that's what we should be thinking about um, test assessments that drive and support learning, not just tested. Thank you, Alice. And I think there's, yeah, there's something there that um, those of us who, who kind of work in or around education will recognize around this notion of um, authentic assessment practice. Assessment, you know, assessment practice should be authentic learning experiences in their own right, wherever possible. Um, I'd like to turn um, uh, at least for a few minutes to issues around staff and staff development and teacher education. Alice, you talked about competencies there. Um, uh, we've, we've talked and Alex has talked about the, the kind of challenge for staff in moving to fully online teaching um, and, and the whole kind of readiness around some of them were maybe more prepared than others, but actually teaching online was new for, for the vast majority of our teachers at whatever level of the sector. So Alex, I wonder if we can unpack this a little bit with yourself. Um, so you talked about professional development for educators. Um, how do you think we can harness and share the best practices, the best learning and teaching practices that have emerged through COVID-19? Um, and you mentioned also communities of practice. How can we support the further development of resilient educator communities of practice as we move forward with the lessons learned from COVID? Thanks, Keith. Um, I think I think that we're already beginning to see this happening. So, uh, and Louise mentioned, uh, you know, having digital artifacts and and. Uh, examples of good practice to share. So I think repositories for sharing good practice are becoming uh, more commonplace. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, being used across and beyond just an institution. So I think that's really important that we are sharing to a body of knowledge around uh, online learning and teaching and practice and the use of technology in learning and teaching. I think keeping conversations like this going is really important and we've all kind of touched on the fact that we're talking across school, across FE and HE um, and looking at similar challenges and sharing successes and approaches to online learning and teaching through digital spaces. So I think that's really important to continue. Um, again, offering that professional development beyond an institution and, and opening up what we have to offer beyond our immediate uh, community is really important and beyond the education sector as well. So today we've got colleague, uh, uh, participants joining from, from all around, I presume, I can't see you, but uh, uh, I think that's really important uh, to these conversations. Uh, I see that someone has mentioned a physical space being important to learning and, and outdoor space. And I do think there is a, around professional development, at least there is still a need for online, uh, for face-to-face -face professional development. I think there are some instances where you, you can't be coming together uh, as a group. For example, uh, in my area of work, mentoring is quite an isolated uh, activity. So we come together as a group and we explore mentoring face-to-face uh, -face and, quite often outside as well. So I, I, I note that you've mentioned um, out, so you've mentioned outdoor learning and we quite uh, often adopt that. It can be quite tricky uh, in, in Inverness, but looking for those opportunities that are important as well. So hopefully that's answered some of your question. Just conscious of time. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, I'm conscious of time too. Um, uh, it's gone very quickly. I wonder, um, uh, I know that I think we'll all have a perspective perspective on this, but I think Alex, you're involved in professional development for educators around enhancing learning and teaching. 
Louise, you run a program for educators at all levels around developing their blended and online teaching practice. I wonder if just maybe just for a minute, if I can put to both yourself, Alex and Louise, what are the implications do you think of COVID and, and what we've been through for our formal qualifications for teachers, um, uh, our teacher education programs, our postgraduate certificates in teaching for FE and HE lecturers? Do they need to change in any ways coming out of COVID? I think just to jump in there, Keith, I think the one of the things Alex mentioned there earlier was around um, cross cross institutional collaboration around um, teaching. And I think those those conversations are so valuable. And we've uh, it, within Edinburgh Napier, we've kind of embedded the, the dialogue and, and the dialogic approach to thinking about our teaching as a, as a formal assessment within within our teaching qualification. And I think there is something or it's both authentic and uh, but it's also it's a learning experience for for all parties involved, including the assessors as well. And I think um, moving, you know, again, moving beyond that competitive um, idea of institutions working against each other, I think there is probably given the nature of um, technology enhanced learning and the opportunities of, um, you know, being distributed and, and working across different universities um, to provide um, a much richer kind of um, uh, learning experience for our educators would be would be fantastic and, and wholly possible now. Great. Thank you, Louise. And Alex, anything from yourself on formal qualifications for, for educators in any ways in which they might need to change? I don't think I would have much to add other than um... I think it's really important both as uh, in professional de development and in programs of education uh, that we are role modeling the technology that we use in learning and teaching uh, but also that we're using kind of pedagogic approaches uh, that have student-led activities and build peer support and online uh, social presence and that kind of touches on the things that Alice was saying that is linked to social stress and and all those types of things so future-proofing our programs of study that role model um, good online uh, learning and teaching practice. Great, thank you. At this point, I'm just gonna thank and acknowledge um, uh, everyone who's posted um, comments um, that chime with what we're saying in the panel and those that have um, uh, indicated that they've enjoyed the discussion. Uh, if we've not got around to your specific question, I do apologize, um, but I see that time really has just run away from us in, in many ways. Um, one of, the, one of the final questions that came in, uh, and it's one I think we'd like to finish on, Angela's asked, how do we avoid the danger of retreating back into the comfort of the familiar? Now, I, I am aware that when this session finishes at two, it actually cuts out. So Janet, I'm gonna to come to you in the first instance, and if we get to anyone else, that would just be a bonus. Um, given where you started from, Janet, in your introduction, can I ask you, what do you think are the dangers of, going, of trying to go back to where we were before COVID in terms of educational practice? We, 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 will, we need to move, we just need to move. Uh, it, it, it would be wrong to go backwards. Uh, I, I think uh, the dangers are that we would get uh, fat and unhappy again and, we, and disruption actually creates positive change. And COVID is disruptive, we need to take advantage of it. Thank you very much. I'm seeing nods from, from Alice and uh, yeah, I'm sure, um, and also kind of Alex and Louise, I'm sure we're all in that same position. Um, uh, we're just about on two, uh, two o'clock, so that's gonna, incredibly quickly but thank you for sharing your expertise um, and your views um, and thank you to those who posted questions and comments uh, really do appreciate it we hope you've enjoyed this panel session and any other events in curious 2021 2020, 2021 that you've been to thank you very much mm -hmm.